Thank you for joining us for this conversation with the Talent Magnet Institute, uh, powered by Centennial. I want to welcome a very dear friend, uh, one of my 3 a.m. friends, um, the CEO of Risk Source, Jonathan Theaters. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, you are, I know you've been extremely busy uh, during this time helping organizations like ours and uh, many others manage through this time. Um, so I appreciate uh, you joining and being able to share some resources for our customers that are listening, our friends that are listening and tuning into this episode. Um, Jonathan, what are, let's just talk about kind of initially, what are two of the major pain points that you're hearing and seeing from your clients right now? Well, I think uh, if, if anything, I mean, it's, we're all living this this uh, kind of a movie nightmare all, all at the exact same time. So, um, and I think from our perspective, it's the disruption to daily business operations. It's trying to operate our business 100% um, remotely. Um, and while at the same time answering just hundreds and hundreds of questions every day from our clients that are concerned, confused, and wondering where to go. So, so I think from our standpoint, the two biggest things that we're hearing um, are with regard to the disruption of business and, and for those that are entirely shut down or those that have um, you know, some form of business disruption, um, as well as um, you know, just the increased risks and the, and the challenges around remote uh, workforce. Um, and dealing with some of the governmental regulations as far as what is an essential worker, what is an essential workforce, what is an essential business. Um, do I fit in that realm? What do I assume when I'm um, either deemed an essential business or, um, you know, by having my employees still in here, am I take increasing my risks by having them potentially exposed to the coronavirus? And so those are the kind of questions that we're fielding every day. Hmm. And I know you've also, so you've set up a kind of a COVID-19 portal for many of your customers. Can you talk about, and I know that was set up very, very quickly. Can you talk about that resource for those listening? And, and also let's talk about how your team got that up so quickly. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it was really early on, um, kind of, um, I mean, uh, we, started our Coronavirus Resource Center. Um, I had not even heard those words. Now it seems like there's quite a few of them out there <laughs> these days. Uh, but we wanted a centralized, I was getting bombarded with information and questions and, and really wanted to have one place where we could send our trusted people to that we know it's been vetted, it's been organized and, and we're kind of streamlining because you can really get just, you know, completely inundated and, and crushed by too much information. Um, and so that was the, really the, the organizing part of it. And we really broke it up into a couple different sections. One was just the news of the day, the things that you need to know, um, SBA loans, access points, things of that nature, um, uh, CDC, you know, best recommendations, but also wanted to provide some things. What is that work at home guide? What should I be thinking from a human resource perspective or from a leadership perspective? Um, how do you how do you move an entire workforce in there? So providing resources and tools and downloadables um, that can be used to kind of gear a lot of those conversations. Um, and then the other two big risk areas um, that are really, I think, coming out of this that a lot of people aren't talking about exactly is um, is around cyber liability um, and the risk increased risks of um, hacking and you know anytime there's chaos um, there's going to be some people that want to take advantage of that and so um, what we're seeing is much a higher degree of um, phishing expeditions and people sending out you know junk emails and they're using coronavirus because we're so heightened to want to click on everything um, as as that fish to try to to drag in and so um, and then the other piece is anxiety. And, and that's another part that we've been really seeing a lot of lately um, is, is around, you know, how do you work from home for long periods of time and not only work from home, which a lot of people have had that type of situation before, um, but your kids are normally at school, your spouse is not normally there. Um, so juggling entire family life at the same time um, as, a, as a work um, work situation. I know for some of our employees, um, it's been, hey, we have an office and it's great because my husband or my wife or whatever uses it two days a week. I use it a day or two a week. 
Um, but now we're both home all the time. And so one of us is at the kitchen table, one of us is actually in the office and, and that's, that's great for a day, but that's tough to live a life ongoing like that. So. Um, for those listening, please go down to your chat box. If you have any particular questions that we can uh, direct to Jonathan, we have this set up so you can submit those confidentially and uh, I'll make sure to cover those. So if there's particular things that for those who are attending with us uh, want to ask or want some guidance on, um, Jonathan has offered uh, himself being a resource in this conversation for any of you, which we greatly appreciate and uh, always want to bring value to our to our listeners and those attending this conversation. So, uh, Jonathan, when you talk about the, um, you know, you have a variety of different topics to, to manage through. You've got mm -hmm. um, keeping employees safe, you know, what if one tests positive, how do you manage that? Um, you have organizations that are essential that still have to follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, what I'm finding with some of our clients is some of those essential businesses are actually landing particular orders regarding to PPEs that are increasing their manufacturing need in that case um, or technology need. So you still have to follow CDC guideline, but we have a throughput that's went that's went up. Um, and then you have some retail organizations that are, you know, have unfortunately had to go through furlough or layoff already. That's another huge topic I'd love to love to talk to you about. Um, so let's talk about the CDC guidelines and how an essential organization needs to manage that. And then those that are trying to keep themselves open to walk up or curbside or, you know, any retail type of environment um, that you still have a human to human interaction. Um, you know, what are you sharing with those customers? I know you serve that industry quite a bit as well. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we're constantly referring toward, you know, I mean, you know, that is one area where you just have to stay up on what's coming out from one, the CDC, but, um, but also the federal and the state or local governments because um, they're putting out their own regulations for that. So um, obviously in Ohio, where a predominant amount of our customers are, um, you know, the governor has been uh, very aggressive, very early. Um, I, I am hopeful that this is a, a way that to control it um, um, in a good way. But uh, um, but one one of the things is, um, and I try to not use the word social distancing um, as much as physical distancing because I think um, we all strive to want to be with people um, and to connect with the human element, which is mm -hmm. I think is is really really important too. So, mm -hmm. um, but when you're in a manufacturing setting, a warehouse setting. I mean, those, those six feet parameters still work for you. And that's tough in a lot of situations. Um, and so really setting forth what, how do we operate in this world that allows our business to continue uh, because it is deemed essential, um, but live in the parameters, making sure that there's hand sanitizer, that you're checking, checking temperatures at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, you know, all of those things that are requirements, you really have to put into place in a systematic way. Um, and uh, to keep things going. So, so definitely follow the rules there. And it seems like every day something else pops up that, that, that needs to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. And the mental health, are you, uh, when you look at the risk associated or insurance, is there insurance policies that are covering that for mental well being right now? Well, I, I think there's, there's a multitude of insurances that are. Um, have the potential. Um, every policy needs to be um, addressed and, and reviewed independently with their broker and their insurance company. And, and if there's claims to be made, when is the appropriate time for that? So um, it's, a, it's a really individualistic. Uh, one thing that I can tell you after reviewing 25 probably different insurance company forms um, on the property casualty side alone, um, uh, everyone's a little bit different. And so you have to be really, uh, it's a, it, the devil's in the details as far as words go. So, but workers' compensation is one area. Um, that's a lot of question. If I contracted at work, is that covered by workers' comp? Um, not typically. Um, it, it potentially could be in this situation. It's the same way that if you got the regular flu and you gave it to your you know, your person sitting next to you and they were off work for three days because they had the flu, that would not be a worker's comp claim. It had nothing to do with the scope of the work um, per se. Now, where you might find some coronavirus coverage is, is 
um, in any healthcare setting where you're required, it's part of your job is to be in there. Or you could, a typical area that would not normally have been, but maybe today is, is the grocery store. Um, where a lot of those workers are being um, forced to work or they have to work in that situation. They're being put in front of the public in a, in a different situation based on what we are. So, so th there could be some workers' compensation um, that's available, uh, but there's also a lot of legislation that's trying to dictate, um, but every state is going to be uniquely different um, in that regard. Health insurance for the predominant um, area, they're covering these type of situations. So if somebody comes down and they have medical bills increased, whatever, for the most part, um, those are situations that are, that would be um, covered. But again, I'm not a health insurance um, expert. So refer, I always like to refer those to, to those people, but in a general sense. Um, one of the real um, challenges for a lot of businesses is in the business interruption um, standpoint. Um, so they buy business income insurance. Uh, you know, if their building catches on fire and they're out uh, for six months while it's being rebuilt, well, you want to keep your people on staff. So you have payroll costs that are continuing. You might have your mortgage. You might have ongoing costs. You're not going to necessarily buy all your raw materials. So you might, it's not exactly you know, everything, um, cause it would, um, but it's going to replace all that lost income. And, and so that was the original piece. Hey, I am a restaurant and I am out of business. Um, I should have business income insurance. Well, one of the challenges in our industry, um, and it's the real issue with pandemic type risk is that the insurance is for direct physical damage. Um, and now this is where the semantics comes important, where some insurance companies have a very well-defined, uh, virus exclusion or direct physical damage is saying direct physical damage to the structure. Um, but, and, but in most instances, I would say anybody that I've dealt with, there's not really been a direct physical damage. Actually, none of our clients have actually had the coronavirus diagnosis yet um, at their location. So they haven't been, but this is state ordered civil authority that have said, you are, you have to be out of business. And so it's thrown the industry for a, in a tailspin because they're saying, one, we didn't really underwrite or charge for this type of risk. Mm -hmm. Two, it's not really covered. Um, is it even insurable? Is it more because it's so national and so large in scale, can the insurance industry even absorb something like this without the costs going so out of control for every single uh, purchaser? Is this mm -hmm. more of a federally backstopped type situation similar to terrorism things of that nature where 9-11 was such a big disruption to our, our world. Um, does the federal government need to have that backstop? So there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, you know, I, 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 I say it's very similar to our own businesses that we've had to adjust and go to work from home. Um, you're kind of doing it on the fly and, and uh, nobody likes a uh, fly, especially when you don't like to work on the fly when they're contracts, because that makes it even more difficult. But I would say that um, there's a lot of this, just, just so many moving pieces. And, um, and it'll be interesting to see where it settles out. And what we've just told our clients is, um, we're going to be your advocate and we're going to push forward. And if there is a dollar to be found, we're going to find it. And mm -hmm. so we're just going to push forward for you. Jonathan, if, if someone, one of the questions that was posed, if someone were to test positive mm -hmm. in a work environment, is that employee's privacy protected? Yeah, so uh, I would, um, again, I would definitely check with legal counsel from your standpoint, but from a general sense, the way that we have said is that the privacy needs to be maintained for that individual. So if, if, um, if Mike, you and I work together and, um, you know, I got diagnosed with coronavirus and you're my super supervisor, you would come, we would have that interaction. You would obviously send me home. Um, I've got to be quarantined, do whatever. And that's going to be based on your family leave policy, uh, maybe some of the things that the government's put out. Um, but you'll deal with me individually. What the, the first thing that somebody should do is talk about who have you had interactions with in the last two weeks. So, I need you to list out the people, shoot me an email, let's do it right now, whatever it may be. But what coworkers have you been with? What suppliers, vendors, customers? Um, and try to get a comprehensive list. And what we suggest is having those direct conversations with those individuals. So if they've met 15 people, go pull them aside. You would not want to share you know, it was Jonathan Theaters, it was John Doe or Jane Doe, um, but you had, we have had an employee that's been diagnosed with coronavirus. Um, our understanding is that you may have had contact with them. 
we're going to ask you to quarantine for a couple weeks, um, whatever those, um, whatever your guidelines are stipulating at the time. Um, and then for every other staff member that may not have, um, directly had any contact with is just a general email. Someone within our company has been diagnosed, you know, communication. And I do have a little write up that I'm happy to supply to you that if you want to send out Mike that kind of you know, writes down a lot of these kind of policies and procedures. Okay. Um, I'm happy to share that with you. I'll, I'll shoot you an email for that. Okay. Yeah. And for those listening, um, shoot me an email or a message. Um, you can even do it right now. Yep. Um, send me an email if you have my email address. If you don't, um, uh, put it in the chat here and we'll, sh we'll send you an email. You can uh, put your email address in the chat box and the, yep. um, our panelists uh, can handle that and get it over to you. Thank you, Jonathan, for providing yep. that. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, and I know you and I have even had this discussion about um, overcoming communication challenges with remote teams. You know, yep. it's like one day we were all together, the next day we weren't allowed to be, right? So um, I know I've shared in a couple of uh, ep episode recordings we did last week that um, I was meeting with an HR executive and he was like, it was the strangest thing, Mike. I've walked into my place of work on Friday and as the uh, director of HR, I'm watching seven employees walk out with their monitors. We don't have a monitor take home policy, like, you know, um, and obviously, you know, he didn't stop them. He was, you know, but it was just a great example of these things we never think about until yeah. it happens, right? So um, overcoming remote challenges with, uh, or communication challenges with remote teams, what do you find that's working? What are you hearing that's working from your clients? And what do you also hear that's not working um, that you're seeing people adjust around? Yeah, so I, I can speak from our experience. Um, I mean, back in Hurricane Ike time in 2009, um, it really hit me hard. We were down without power for two or three days um, and, you know, I, you know, I, what, there's a few times you want your insurance agent to be there for you. And it's usually when something bad happens. Mm -hmm. And so uh, living in a, in a society, in a, in a community, um, when something bad happens, especially like a tornado or windstorm, something of that nature happens to one person, it's very likely if it happens to us, we could be down at the same time our customers need us the most. Yeah. And so, um, so it really hit me back in 2009. We have got to be prepared for this much better than we are. And, and so it, from that day forward, when we really worked a plan as far as um, uh, buying a generator and making sure that our technology was redundant, um, we moved over the course of five, six years to the entire company having laptops or services, um, the ability to work from home. Uh, the last three years, we've, we've really pushed everybody to work one day a week from their house. Mm -hmm. um, one, it cuts down on um, drive time and carbon footprint and just good for the earth. Um, uh, but two, it's, um, it, it was allowed to make sure we were prepared. Uh, but three weeks ago, um, when all of this was coming to it, we, we did a practice round because we had never all worked remotely. And we mm -hmm. took a Wednesday um, and uh, practiced and, and then we sent out a survey to all of our staff. What is working? What isn't working? What about your job is harder? What about your job is the same? Um, and we just did that through a constant contact survey, gathered all the information, um, and then we learned from that. And so I would suggest that to, for people to do today. It's very simple, um, but what have you learned? Oh, what I've learned is, is that um, I really need a printer. You know, I'm burning through ink cartridges. <laughs> oh, wait, what are you doing ink cartridges? Oh, um, you know, my monitor set up or I didn't realize that my husband was going to be home too. And now we have no real office desk um, for both of us. So we learned a lot of those type of situations. Um, and then, of course, uh, we came back on a t Thursday and a Friday. Um, and on Friday, we, we had announced, hey, we're going to work from home all next week. Um, and I really thought it was going to be a, a full test to say, I think this is coming. Let's just, you know, you can't always yeah. tell what something's broken after one day of doing anything, but if we right. can stretch five days, we'll start to see and we'll learn even more. And so, and of course we've never been back. And so I'm the only one in the office um, most of the time. Um, um, our president, Amanda comes in and, um, and but everybody else has been 100% work from home. From an operational standpoint, I'd say it's pretty seamless. Technology, telephones, computers, all that's going couldn't be any better. Um, and what we've tried to do is maintain that sense of culture um, and the sense of connectiveness 
So our Tuesday morning meetings, we run um, our all staff meetings. We run very similar to the way we did in person. That's the one day a week where we always had it. Everybody in our office was Tuesdays. Um, and so we still do that. Everybody pops up on their um, uh, video screens and we get to see everybody. Um, and then a big portion of what we do probably breaks off some HR rules and all of that, but um, we do pray together and we, 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 we do that every Tuesday morning. And we still do that over the um, WebEx video conference, um, which I think is, um, is really good. And, and, uh, and people share and feel connected. And, um, and then another couple things that I've been really had fun with, it was one of our employees, Casey, she, she has a really strange connection to pens. I mean, it's bizarre. I mean, at any one time, she might have a hundred pens on her desk and half of them are chewed on. I mean, they're, they're pretty rough. Um, and so I, I grabbed all the pens in the office and I threw them on my desk and I, just said, you know, I took a picture that said, you know, thinking, uh, missing my teammates, thinking of you, love you, Casey. And, um, and it got a little chuckle and a laugh. And then, and I thought, Oh, I'm going to go do somebody else. And so every day, um, I've been sitting in somebody else's desk, um, where they normally are and posing something that's personal that reminds me of them. And, um, it, it's been a lot of fun. People have been joking. Oh, this is your best one yet. Um, but you know, the, any way we can try to make the human connection virtually, um, I think is important and get creative because it's, uh, you know, we're in this, we're not getting out of it anytime soon. This isn't a choice, yeah. uh, but we do need to figure out some ways to, to have some fun too. Yeah, that's a great example. So we um, just today, our team uh, logged in and apparently on zoom, our team figured out very quickly how to, uh, how to change their backgrounds. Um, I still okay. have not changed my background, but um, you know, we've, we've been having a variety of, of discussions every week on Zoom. Um, I'll pop up one here for those, uh, those watching um, in the conversation. So uh, we have a, a Notre Dame grad amongst us. So he changed, um, his background. Um, we also have Janelle, who's our uh, marketing leader. Um, she popped up here with some some funny glasses. Um, I don't know if you all can see that. Hopefully you can. Oh, yeah. um, but you know, we we also decided that it's very hard to get a candid Zoom shot because there's always someone <laughs> that yeah. that doesn't look very happy. Uh, so today we encouraged us all to smile so we could take this picture. So. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, as you mentioned, keeping this time uh, being intentional, right, being thoughtful, asking what you can do. I had a client just last week um, used a piece of software. Apparently, it's a banking software called Divi, D-I-V-B-Y. And they basically sent all their employees a little bit of money for lunch um, through this account, right? So they could use this account and pay a um, client that we support who's doing that. Um, we know organizations that have also kind of pooled money together for their own employees that have had to be furloughed or went through a downsizing. We've also seen organizations and team members that have pooled money uh, together to also um, help help a cause, right? Put money into a relief fund, uh, provide resources. Uh, but we would encourage everyone to just kind of make, you know, make this time what it is, accept what it is. Um, and, uh, and ensure that you're living out, you know, we've tell people you're living, you can't make up your values now, right? Your core values are going to show up by the way you're treating people, the way you're communicating and the yeah. way you're making people feel right. And your culture is made up of the thousands and thousands of interactions that you have each and every day. Um, by the definition of, uh, of Lynn rule, who's one of our, uh, faculty members and, yeah advisors to our family and um, in our business and cultures made up of those interactions, right? So what are your people feeling even during a difficult time such as this, even one where you have to make difficult decisions, um, your culture is going to show up, right? Absolutely. And your core values are going to show up. And the question is, if you put yourself in your other, other employees, shoes what are they feeling right now yeah 
Um, Jonathan, let's talk a little bit about crisis planning in general. I remember it seems like just a, f a few short eight, nine months ago, I came to you and said, Jonathan, I have a client who has asked me, what is my crisis plan? And um, and we didn't have one eight months ago, right? So, yeah. you know, of course, within a few seconds, I had a, a model and a template that I could fill in and uh, you helped us go through that uh, mm -hmm. for this particular customer. Um, but what if, uh, so one, um, to you, what does a crisis plan look like? Is it already, um, how many organizations do you feel had one and how many have turned to you to say, Jonathan, we need to think through a crisis plan right now and, and what yeah. this can look like? Well, I think twofold. One, uh, not many, many people have one. Usually the requirements from a supplier or a, a customer that requires it, that's usually how they come through. A few will be proactive and, and, and. Um, uh, do one voluntarily, but a lot of it's pushed through by others. But I, I tell you, right now is no better time to plan a crisis than when you're in the midst of a crisis, because mm -hmm. you're living it in real time. So take a template, start gathering what you know, what you've learned, what works, what doesn't work. Who are those leaders that step up? Who are the leaders that are really struggling? Um, you know, who, um, who are your go-tos? Who are your vendors that are there for you? Um, when you reach out to them, um, they respond, one who hasn't been, um, but just really gathering. I mean, right now is the perfect time to plan for a crisis because you're in it. So, so document what's working, what's not working, but um, there's plenty of templates out there. We have some on our website that are free and downloadable. Um, you can just go right to it and hit the button and it, it'll get you 90% there. We don't know who your vendors are and we don't know the specifics of how you want to address things, but um, but you can fill that part in. Um, but that's that's the important part is just to to, to plan. Uh, we are in the process of developing a pandemic emergency uh, management plan. Uh, we have a template that's probably ninety five percent complete. Um, it's one that um, it was until today. I mean, if I um, two months ago, if I went to a thousand companies and said we need to talk about pan and be prepare for a pandemic risk, maybe one thousand of those would say. I have no time for that. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, there are not, you know, it's, we kind of are a society around, we, we move by um, crisis anyway. So now I say is the perfect time to address those things. And how where, we, where on your website, is that in the, uh, the resource guide? That is, um, no, um, there, it will actually be there. We actually just talked about that today, but under uh, tools, and resources. tools and resources are at risk source you'll scroll down and there's one on crisis management. There's a whole suite of things that can be downloadable okay. under there. Um, but you'll also find things like active shooter guides and, you know, there's cybersecurity and cyber incident response plans. There's, there's a whole section under at resource that um, are free and downloadable resources for, okay. for you. Okay. So, so what I'll do uh, for everyone, I'm going to provide, um, a link there. A link uh, for yeah. business, business tools. Yep. And um, for you to go there. So we want to. I also provided a link in the chat. If you go to your chat and you're uh, listening on Zoom, I um, <clears throat> so I just shared that. Um, yeah. And so. then I do encourage again for those who haven't. We've all so kind of one of the questions that uh, many people have been asking us is. Uh, Mike, what news sources are you following, right? So I kind of, I even shared one of my employees was like, Mike, there's so many options. Uh -huh. How are you keeping track? And what I'm doing um, is basically picking a couple of individuals who I know are aggregating everything else, right? Correct. So I'm looking to my bank, I'm looking to my CPA, and I'm looking to our insurance companies, both healthcare and property casualty and risk and, and you know, we happen to uh, utilize um, Jonathan Peters and his risk first team for a lot for our business as an advisor. So go to your aggregators, those individuals that are trying to keep their customers real time up to date and they're procuring and curating all of the content, distilling it down, figuring out what we should actually be following, what do we need to, uh, those are things that, um, that we want to make sure we provide. So I provided to the panelists in the chat. Um, for those listening, we'll provide a link to this as well. 
And um, I've got one more uh, link here that I'm going to provide um, that uh, Jonathan has provided over to us. Um, so a couple other questions, uh, Jonathan, where do responsibilities fall for the crisis plan? What in, in a, um, you know, in a, let's say a medium sized organization, a large organization and a small organization, can you share who typically holds that responsibility? If I'm listening and I'm the COO, who do I turn to? If I'm yeah. the, hey, we have a couple of heads of HR and CEOs on the call, mm -hmm. um, who do I turn to for that information? Yeah, so I hate to give a vague answer because every company is set up a little bit different. Um, um, th without a doubt, it is the CEO's responsibility for crisis management. Um, I think that's when that when that particular leader um, has to be in the forefront. Uh, that doesn't mean that they do everything, um, but he or she should be the leader of that. It needs to be the sign off to say this is important, this is our plan, and this is done. Typically, it runs into one of two areas: the COO or the head of HR. Okay. Um, I think it is much more of an operations type situation. That's my personal opinion, um, because it gets into a lot deeper than just the human element. But you'll you, there would be interaction amongst any of the whole team. Yeah. So um, because it, there is a lot of crossover, but I think a lot of people think about just the human aspect, which is completely important, um, but miss the operational pieces. Um, just thinking, you know, if you know, from an operations standpoint, um, how do you have redundancy in jobs? I mean, everybody knows you should have cross-training. Um, some of us are better at it and certain roles are easier at it. Um, but just thinking right now, if somebody's down, you know, say they get diagnosed or you get, um, they're going to be out for a couple of weeks. Is there somebody to be able to do that job? You know, I mean, really thinking through those type of situations um, when you don't have a problem, will help lead you to, hey, we really need to address this right now. How do we effectively do cross-training? How do we effectively address these areas? And it won't only help during these type of situations, it helps with workers' comp. You know, one of the things that I um, tell people, there's a mis misnomer, I'm not gonna say it ever doesn't happen, but at some times people will have, you know, their, one of their employees gets hurt, um, and then the second employee gets hurt and the third employee gets hurt and they're like, oh, people just want to stay at home and they want to take advantage of the system. That may happen, but that's not usually the correct. Usually people get hurt when they are overworked or sleepy, tired, or doing a job that they're not familiar with or doing extra time. And so if I am injured on a workforce and John or Jane come up to help support whatever function I did, chances are they're more tired. They're doing a job they're not normally for too. The, in, the in opportunity for them to get hurt is so far greater than if I was still working. And so um, really addressing just cross training in general is a good risk management technique, just purely from a non pandemic situation, just a daily good work. And so, so yeah, I think having those is really, really important. So. Excellent. And let's talk a little bit about, um, furlough and layoff situations. I think that's a topic that's becoming so timely and so important. And um, how are you, I'm sure you've even po possibly even had to help some clients manage through this. Um, what are some of the best practices and steps that you're suggesting to your customers? Well, I hate, I hate to say it's, it, it's a difficult situation. It's one that every company is going to be unique in, the, in their own. Um, and with, um, if you're under 500 lives um, and you have some of this CARES Act money that's potential for you and things of that nature, your answer might be very different than if you, you don't. So um, there's health insurance um, issues and challenges, especially on the larger groups that have self-insured plans, um, that a furlough may be easier than a complete layoff as you're dealing with the structure of, of, of health insurance issues. Um, things of that nature. Um, so I, I think to me, it's um, grab, um, and of course, it'll all be virtual these days, but um, your, your attorney, your insurance provider, accountant, um, probably HR pers um, professional, um, whether that's in-house or outsourced, um, and really talk about individually, what is the best situation for me to per for the long-term success of the company. Um, and that, that long-term success of the company is um, you know, not only what's, you know, you know, it's taking care of the employees, it's taking care of the business, your customers, your suppliers. Um, we have one client, um, 
um, that I was talking to earlier today, you know, they're, they've, they've never had a company layoff in their entire hundred year history. Um, and you know, they go from 560 people to eight. Wow. Um, and, uh, they really felt like they had diversity in their, um, supply chain or their, their customer base. And they actually do. They're in three totally different industries. Um, but three totally three industries that have zero business right now, completely shut down by this. And so, um, you know, there's real challenges and issues and, um, they go on and, and then of course the challenge for them is at 560 employees, how does this money apply to me when it's capped 500? And so, so every situation is going to be uniquely different. Um, but, um, I think in a general sense, uh, people want to do the right thing. They want to care and take care of their employees. Um, and I don't believe you can over communicate. Um, um, you know, but I think from a leadership standpoint, we have to be out there. Um, and what I've told our staff is we can't change the situation. The situation is what it is. It's difficult. It's hard. It's frustrating. I've never, I, I've never worked so many 15 and 18 hour days in a row in my career. And I really don't want to do this any longer, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the world we're in. But I tell them all the time, lean into this. You know, you know, especially from a, a standpoint of, you know, people that we deal with in our industry, you know, if people go on their heels, this is an opportunity. So, you know, let's, let's, you know, I don't want to say take advantage of the situation, but we can control what we can do and lean into this, innovate, create a new opportunity. You know, our salespeople are saying nobody wants to take a first meeting. Well, that's an easy deal. I, I wouldn't want to take a first meeting with somebody. I'm not going to meet and talk about this at this juncture. Um, and so sales has an easy, you know, scapegoat to say nobody wants to talk. Well, what about being a thought leader? What about the amazing content we've developed over the last years? Pump this out, push it out, you know, become you know, a resource that people in the community want to look to and say, this is important. And then the world always comes around, whether that comes around to you or it comes around to somebody else, the world is always circular. Um, but be the thought leader. Salespeople today should have no real excuse to not be as, just as busy as they were a month ago. It just it looks vastly different. Um, so, um, but lean into this situation as best you possibly can because we're all in it together. Yeah. Do you, um, to those listening, again, can continue to share with us and send uh, Jonathan and I questions so we can make sure we're providing you timely and uh, relevant feedback um, to really help you uh, right now with your business and your team and yourself personally, right? I, I know you were sharing uh, before, um, and I was on the call this morning with a group of people, we're gonna be putting on a mental health and uh, mental wellness um, yeah. conversation. I'm going to be having a discussion tomorrow uh, with a leader talking about um, mental wellness and what that looks like, um, that you have individuals who, like me, right, get energized by being around others. And it's not quite the same when it's virtual. Um, and people like yourself, right, that are working 16, 18 hour days to serve the client and it's demanding, demanding, demanding. Um, you know, I've shared with a couple individuals, my kids wish I um, I, too, have been working from our office, um, but I uh, am on my end. I have an entire floor right now by myself, so everybody's at home. But my kids are like, Dad, can you come home and be quarantined with us? Right. And even that takes its toll on me. Right. Yeah. That They would like for me to be home and to be able to play Scrabble. And um, but right now I'm I'm also responsible um, to our employees, to our customers to the people who are calling, even on the weekends. I mean, I'm sure you're dealing with it because I've done it to you uh, the last yeah. two weeks. Like, you know, I've been getting calls on the weekends of Mike, what do we do to get on the essential list? How do we make sure that we are on? That question I mentioned to you earlier, we've got several clients that are, that are extremely busy right now and ramping up production during, you know, how do we do this? We had an employee on Saturday uh, reach out to us and said, we just, we're in the process of landing a ventilator um, contract and we're going to need 75 employees in two weeks. Um, and how do you do that during this time? Right. But we're, we're as business owners trying to respond to these real time needs. Um, what do you recommend to those, um, just on taking care of ourselves? What are some yeah. steps that you're reading articles that you're reading and things you're even doing for yourself right now? Um, yeah. or is that all out the window? 
For me, it is all out the window. I really wish every day I come home and I say I'm getting on the Peloton. Every day I could say I'm going to go walk the dogs and I just literally crash. Um, so don't do as I say, <laughs> or don't do as I do, <laughs> do as I say. Um, but uh, I think for the messages that we've been given to our staff is stick with a schedule. Um, and, you know, Colleen in our office has, had a really great idea. Um, but she told everybody, she sent an email to the, all the, the entire company and said, my drive time every day that I normally went to work, I do on the treadmill. I'm just converting the time that I normally would drive to work at the beginning of my day and the end of my day to get on my treadmill at home. And I think what an easy thing to do. If you can be, if you can give yourself that to say, Hey, I have a 20 minute drive to work or a 10 minute drive to work or a 45 minute drive to work, convert that same time, like stick to whatever schedule you normally had, but create that at home because it can become very lonely at home um, for a lot of people. Um, you know, over time, um, we tell people, um, our staff use technology to connect with loved ones. Um, and I know, um, some of our employees have some really, um, you know, five, six, seven grandchildren, or they have parents that are out of town or they can't go see their parent because they're afraid that they, we don't want to get them sick, you know? And so, but how do you use technology to connect with those loved ones and transform in a little different way? Um, and I, and I think that that's really important. Um, getting exercise, um, we're pushing, um, um, a lot to just say, how can we do things during webinars? I mean, I've, I've probably attended more webinars than I have in a year in the last three months, you know, three weeks. And, um, so, you know, if you can sit on a treadmill and go through the webinar while you're listening, what a better use of time to get your body moving a little bit while you're doing that. Um, and then one of the other things too, and, and it goes through this information overload, but, um, is we, we tell people remain informed don't like obsess. And, and I think that that's really, really important because we do want to remain informed. And so what I've, what I've personally been doing is, you know, because I read so much and I've been, you know, online so much and I've been doing all this, I have just found that 60s on six when I'm driving in the morning and in the afternoon, like there's no bad that ever happens in 60s music, like ever. Like it's always happy. It's kind of corny, actually. Sixties uh, music. Sixties music. Nothing oh, bad okay. ever happens in sixties music. So I only listen to sixties on six in the morning because I need like something to change the dynamic. Because if I just listen to NPR or a newscast or something of that nature, I mean, it, there's no break from this, and you'll yeah. you you got to give yourself the break and not obsess around it. Um, and then the other part too is um, mindfulness and gratitude. Um, we've been really, really trying to at our staff to to really be mindful, um, but also say thank you a tremendous amount and encourage our staff when they see things like somebody help. I get it would be if we were all in one room and I helped you, Mike, you would very likely give me that feedback right away to say, hey, thanks. That really helped. That helped me in my day and, I, and made me feel good. When we're all remote working, we don't always have that same connection. And so what we've been saying is make those virtual connections, whether that's you want to tell the whole company how this employee made you feel and made this experience better for a client, customer, or community, go for it. Um, or if you want to do it one-on-one, -on -one, do it one-on-one, -on -one, but, but give positive feedback and, and um, be grateful for all the things that people are doing because we're all in this together. And so, um, and, and you really see some great, great stories of, of appreciation come out. And so to me, I think a lot of that is just, you know, I think that as leaders, that is our job is to assess the situation that we're in, know what we control, control and what we can't control, understand it, and then provide good, solid connection to our staff, our customers, our community, and remain relevant. So um, I think that's our primary function today uh, is just keep everything going. Yeah, yeah. So another question, thank you for sharing that, um, everyone. I hope you uh, can take some of those thoughts and comments away. There's two things that I've been encouraging people to do it is journal um, on the gratitude, right? Think about the things that we're thankful for. Um, I've shared in some of our courageous leadership discussions around every time you walk through a doorway, um, think about something you're thankful for, because during this time, it's important that we focus our attention 
on the things that are going well and that we're simply thankful for. Um, so I have one question that came up, which I think is a great question. Um, thank you for submitting it. Um, will this event and crisis drive up uh, insurance premiums uh, rates significantly change the claims ratio for future renewal cycles and um, any opinion on factor changes? Yeah, um, I think that's actually, a, that's a great question. Um, so I, I'll just give you my gut because who knows where this ultimately ends up. Um, so what my feeling is, is that if, if this then turns into uh, the pandemic it can be, I would expect health insurance um, rates to increase. I mean, I think it's going to be some, um, if it's not federally backstopped and there's not some dollars that are provided on the back end to help support this, um, th these are all incidences that are not being attributed. Now, on the, on the downside or on the other side is that all those elective surgeries that are typically covered are almost, for all intents and purposes, not happening. So you may not see the industry have the struggle that they're having right now, um, but those will be compounded costs because the, those surgeries that were spread out over the couple months that there are no elective surgeries, they're all going to be crammed into a shorter time span. Um, so it's, it's very similar to when the automakers all threw out 0% interest and all of a sudden auto sales went through the roof. And everybody was like, oh, this is great. Look how many auto sales. And then once everybody bought a car, I mean, how often do you buy a car? Um, then they were like, wait, where did the auto sales go? Well, it's because you forced everybody to buy a car when they weren't really ready to. They were maybe going to buy one in six months. But yep. hey, it's 0%. I'm not buying it now. And so I, I think this uh, on, on elective surgery, I think healthcare is going to be changed a lot because of, um, you think some of these hospital systems, oh, they have to be doing really well really well financially right now because of all this. Well, their money maker is, is surgery, elective surgery. Um, and um, so, so I should say, I was saying non-elective surgery. It'd be elective surgery or what they've been cut out. So sorry for the, um, but uh, on the property casualty side, if, um, if business interruption um, doesn't really turn into a covered claim from the insurance company, I don't think you're gonna see a whole lot of disruption on the PNC side. Uh, there may be some, that would be my gut. Um, if that if these are paid by the industry um, uh, through either legislation changes or um, interpretation or legal, um, I, I believe we were heading toward a little bit of a hard market in some lines of coverage anyway. Um, I think it could have exponential. Um, uh, and I'll give you an example of one of our insurance companies that we deal with. Um, they insure um, about 50% of all the YMCAs in the country. Um, all the YMCA's are shut down. Um, they're a struggle. Um, they do offer uh, what appears to be $100,000 worth of pure coronavirus type insurance for it for business interruption. So you can think of all of their clients are probably going to have a $100,000 claim. Easy. I mean, it's, I mean, and um, well, when you put in the numbers, they're about, they only take in about $45 million worth of premium a year and their claims are going to be over $60 million just for that $100,000 sum limit. So that company is going to struggle, would be my guess. Uh, and, and they're only gonna be able to fix that through rate and that'll drive things up for a lot of people or provide opportunities for other insurance companies to, to fill the gap. Um, but uh, so it'll be interesting to see how capacity changes through this and how it directly correlates with increased costs. But my guess would be that I, I think in the long term, um, health insurance, will, will you will feel this. Um, and I believe on the property casualty side, I think we will, um, it will depend on how business interruption in particular is handled, um, but it could be quite significant if it isn't. So, you might. Yeah, go. thank you. Thank you for providing that question. I think that's on everyone's mind. I think what I hear you saying is it depends. It depends yeah. on how. It's too all early to handled. formally tell, yeah. but that's kind of my gut feeling of where we are today. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, so Jonathan, as we, uh, again, for those uh, listening, if you go to risksource.com, I have it written back here, but I don't know, yeah. uh, risksource.com, yeah. <laughs> um, for those that have joined us live, uh, we've submitted these links over to you make sure you check out the chat. Um, is there, um, any thing in particular that you would like to leave our listeners with? 
as they walk away from this conversation and uh, go back to their teams and organizations um, or go back and serve the clients that they work with? Um, what, what, what leave behinds can we provide to them? Well, I think uh, um, from a leave behind standpoint, um, uh, from a physical leave behind standpoint, any resource that we can supply, I mean, um, we're happy to do that. From a, a messaging um, um, leave behind, I kind of go back to what I had said earlier, is that, you know, this is, this is a crazy time that we're all in together. Um, we're, a lot of us are learning on the fly. I think, our in, I think there's some industries that will be forever changed by this. Mm. I think work will be forever changed by this. Um, I, I think if there was ever any fear of work from home, um, well, we're over the fear because we have to do what we have to do right now. Um, and I think that there'll be a lot of business that is um, changed by that. And, and I think in a lot of good ways. Yeah, and I think it could be very, very positive. Mm. I know that um, anytime I had a video conference, if there was a dog barking in the background or a kid that ran into the room, I was always felt a little embarrassed for whoever it was. Um, yeah. Now it's like just everyday life, and yeah. it's, you know yeah. you just move on. So, uh, so there's an empathy, um, um, and I think that what I would also stress, and I and I stressed all of my friends is is to is to be a friend to the world right now. Um, and I generally see that, that people are pretty gracious, um, understanding, um, and, and I think our world almost needed that. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I, I would really, you know, be understanding the employee that's concerned or, you know, I, um, for some of us, we would, I'm looking for any opportunity to be with my family. I mean, this, this is kind of a, a great and delight. Some people don't have the same situation. Um, you know, some are like, Hey, I, you know, I don't, I come to the office every day. So I have a break from everything, but living, you know, spouse, family, kids, dogs, all of that with no break and no other interaction can, can be um, overwhelming and it can take its toll. And, uh, and I don't think we'll see, I think we'll constantly see the evolution of that over the next few weeks. So I think as leaders be connected to your employees, mm -hmm. understand where they are and what they're doing and how you can help which can help. Um, but as, uh, you know, check in with people just thinking about you and, you know, is there anything that you need? What's making your job hard? What's making your job easy? Some things we're going to be able to control some things we won't, but I think gathering that connection will yield long time results for, for everybody. Yeah. It's interesting, Jonathan, on Sunday evening, I was on a, um, HR social hour chat, which is made up of a, a global um, HR community and um, and the group that puts it on, uh, John Thurman and Wendy Daly, um, the host of the HR Social Hour, they, uh, again, these are HR execs from all over the world. Everyone across the globe is in the same place, right? Yeah. Um, we had a variety of people on, I think there were 38, 39 people. Um, and <laughs> there's a new app uh, that I learned about called Kahoot. Yes. K-A-H-O-O-T. We actually did a trivia night for all these HR executives and their families, right? So um, now you can do that with your employees. It doesn't have to be, uh, but but your community, your friends. I know last night I got home and uh, my wife said, hey, we should host a, a Zoom chat for the family, right? We can't all get together. Everybody has kids and nobody can see mama and papa. Let's, uh, let's hop on Zoom and um, then we asked my parents the same thing. Hey, do you want to get my sister from LA and uh, my sister who lives here and, um, you know, everyone together. So use technology, not just for your team, which we're all using, but think about ways to connect to your friends and family. I, uh, yeah. that same, that HR social hour, they, they've done a great job of building community for HR executives and people who serve in the human capital, human resource space. Um, and this, this weekend, uh, this <laughs> Sunday, uh, they're hosting a Everybody Turn On in Indi this uh, particular Indiana Jones movie um, and hit play at 7.05. And we're all going to watch just to build community and keep people um, going and um, make sure we have the connection that we all need during this time. Um, it's key and critical for all of us. So um, and our people use these ideas as leaders to encourage your team to do the same, right? 
Um, I, is to your point earlier, I've been on two Zoom calls this week with people that have had kids on their lap, right? And um, and so long ago, um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that seemed would seem so inappropriate. Now, if you're interviewing or having a business conversation or something, do what you can, right? But I would encourage uh, us to all be more flexible, be more empathetic, um, and it may, may it will make us, if, if not may it will make us be that way post pandemic, right? Yeah. When we get through this crisis, we'll see the world different. Um, yeah. You know, we're going to see the world different. Um, and, uh, and there's a generation right now that are really, their life perspective is being formed by this crisis, right? Yeah. So how you act, how you interact, how you show up at home, how you treat your people, how you treat your colleagues and coworkers and employees. And, um, you know, those all really matter and people are watching, mm -hmm. you know, if you enjoy your work, your children or grandchildren or whoever's in your home, um, you may not have any children or whoever's around you are going to see how you interact right now. You're very visible, uh, which also makes us vulnerable. Right. But, but be real and check yourself and listen to those that are around you. Um, you know, we do uh, recommend uh, to those who are tuning in today, um, if you go to talentmagnetinstitute.com backslash webinar, you can register for the Courageous Leadership uh, webinar if you have not already participated in that. Um, we also have a meeting, a conversation like this tomorrow at noon. Um, that we're going to be hosting with Learning Grove about childcare um, and how childcare, that industry as itself has been completely turned upside down, um, but also um, how that impacts workforce. I have a discussion tomorrow afternoon with Paul Hegan at uh, two o'clock um, on um, wellness and uh, mental, mental health um, and, you know, being positive, being thoughtful. Um, we're going to be on next week with the Brighton Center talking about what communities need to know um, and what's happening in our community, what's really happening in our community right now, and what are the needs and the responses. We have a conversation later next week with Ignite Philanthropy um, that's going to be about how are nonprofits needing to innovate and think differently. Um, we're also uh, hosting another Courageous Leadership webinar next week, and we will be on the Gearing Center's webinar series that they're doing, talking about what works for family and private business owners right now during this crisis. What do we as family and private business owners need to be doing to respond uh, to our customers, to our people, and to ourselves? So, uh, Jonathan, I greatly appreciate uh, your time. Uh, thank you for your leadership, you and your team. Um, thank you for leading boldly and leading well through this crisis for individuals like us um, and those that are tuning in and uh, being a great example uh, to all of us. So thank you to those who tuned in um, and thank you for those that are listening. Continue to submit your questions. Let us know what other tactical uh, things that you need right now. What other strategic things do you need right now? Uh, what other just support do you need right now? Um, so we're in this together. We appreciate uh, all of you. And um, here's to a, a great rest of your day. Thank you Cheers. so much. Stay safe.